Good to be back. Yes. Clark and choir musicians, great. Praise the Lord. A couple of words as our choir is finding their seats. Um, good news. Um, finance team met yesterday. And uh, if you, well, our giving these first nine months of the year has been the best in 10 years. If you take out one-time gifts, the best ever. So I want to commend you. Praise the Lord for what He's been doing uh, this year. Now, God is good and His timing is good. Every roof and air conditioning has also broken this year. <laughs> that being said, we're still uh, in a surplus, but just encourage you to continue just being faithful. We don't want one dollar the Lord doesn't lead you to give, and, uh, but we, we tithe. That's just if you're a believer. If you're not a believer, we're about that later. But when we, in fact, when we, this is not the sermon, this is the pre-sermon. I've always wanted to, to see this happen. When we pray, number one, we pray for the offering. I'd love to see the, the guy who's praying for the offering say, Lord, we give a whole lot, not just a portion. But I've always wanted to say, when we stand up, reach into the pocket of the person in front of you and, uh, and give. You know, I just tell you, I, we're so thankful to the Lord for how He's been providing. We trust in the Lord to provide for us, not in people or, or any of those things, but I just commend you and encourage you to, to keep on. There are so many things for the kingdom we'd like to see accomplished, and it's just, it's, it's a joy. I know it's a joy for you because uh, I wasn't here uh, the last few years, and so I didn't go through some of those harder times, but what a, what a fun time. It's great to go to finance committee meeting for it to be a celebration, so thank you for that. Now, one more word of personal privilege before I begin to preach. My second grandchild was born yesterday morning early, so yeah. Well, not just my grandchild, Kathy's too, uh, but our first granddaughter, and uh, so Adelaide Ruth, and uh, as you can imagine, she is wonderful and precious and all those things, and so be glad to show you a picture later. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much for the chance we've already had today to sing praises to you, to just attempt with our mouths and with our music to say, you're an amazing God. And yet, our, our words fall short. You're so much more than we could ever, ever, ever describe. And now, Lord, as we turn to your word, I pray that you'd speak so clearly. Oh, what a powerful, just a wonderful word from you here in Ephesians. And I just pray that you'd use it in ways that we could have never imagined. And Lord, that your spirit would fall in this place with power and might and authority. You'd comfort, you'd correct, you'd teach, you'd encourage, you'd lead. Oh, God, get glory here. We pray you'd do the work in Albuquerque so great that only you'd get the glory, that you would send revival and spiritual awakening to the churches and to the city. As we pray for our sister churches, today we pray for Anchor Church. And just pray that you would provide for them, equip them, use them to reach the lost. And oh, Lord, now let us have hearing ears and doing hearts to want to act on what you say to us today from your word. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Take your copy of God's Word and turn to Ephesians chapter 1 as we begin a study through the book of Ephesians this morning. Ephesians chapter 1. We'll be in the first eight verses today. And I like to, uh, when I'm dividing up text to study and to present to you, to take uh, at least a paragraph in the Greek and, uh, and, and try not to break thoughts up. Now, in this particular passage, Paul, who was known to write long Greek sentences, verses 3 through 14 is one sentence in the Greek. It's the longest sentence in the New Testament, uh, but it's got so much into it that we'd, in it, we'd be here till 2 or 3 this afternoon if we tried to do the whole thing. And unless you would like, I could do that, but <laughs> we'll stick with the first eight verses uh, this morning uh, in Ephesians chapter 1. Paul an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the kind intention of His will, 
to the praise of the glory of His grace, which He freely lavished or bestowed on us in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. <clears throat> we, I know you're the same as me, we get credit card offers, so it seems like daily. Uh, just this one and that one. And one of my favorite that we receive, we, we have a, a credit card which we use to earn and to accumulate airline miles so we can go see grandbabies and things like that. But uh, we're on the, you know, the, the minimum plan there, and they send us this, this thing, it seems like all the time, and it sounds so great. If we just upgrade to this other airline card, we get Admirals Club memberships all over the world. We get free bags for everybody we've ever known. Uh, they pay our TSA, you know, a membership and, and on and on. And it's like, you know, this is great. I'm sure it's going to cost a little bit more. Well, it's only $450 a year, you know, to do this. And uh, so I say, well, you know, I think I'm okay. Uh, you guys uh, move on. But we get all of these offers in life, and most of them under-deliver on their promises. But Paul in Ephesians 1 here begins what will go on for chapters to describe to us the promises of God that do not underdeliver, in fact, they're, they're indescribable, even though uh, God has given him the words to put them in print for us. And so, uh, just beginning here, we're beginning the book of Ephesus. Paul wrote the book of Ephesus, we believe, during his first Roman imprisonment. And so, he writes to the saints at Ephesus. It was a circular letter. It certainly went to Ephesus, but it went around to other churches as well. There are various themes that you might uh, pull out of the, the book of Ephesus, but he talks about the glories of knowing Christ and then the results in the life of the believer, in our marriages, in our families, in our church as we move on into the latter chapters, but a very rich, rich book here that we begin. And so Paul begins, he, he tells the saints his greetings, and then in verse 2, grace to you and peace. These are not just meaningless uh, salutations here, the grace of God, which he'll describe for us in a moment, which then if you have the grace of God, if you come to know Christ as your Savior, delivers the only way to get true peace, not, not peace between nations, not that kind of lack of war peace, but inner abiding peace that only comes through knowing Christ as your Savior. And then in verse 3, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So three times this same root word, bless, is the same word we get our word eulogy from, where we, we, we eulogize, we, we bless, we say wonderful things about that person. But he says that our God, he said he is blessed, he is worthy of being praised and blessed with our mouths, with our lives, and it's a constant state. He is for all eternity worthy of being blessed. Why? He says, because He has already blessed us, provided for us, given to us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Now, it's in Christ, and you'll see that all through this passage, that all of these promises, all of these riches that Paul is describing to us that come, they come when you know Christ as your Savior. So the bad news is, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, none of what we're saying here, none of what we're reading here is yours. That's the bad news. It's the bad news for every man, woman, boy, and child from the time we're born. We're separated from God. But that was so much not God's will that He left the glories of heaven, and He came and He died on a cruel cross in my place, in your place, so that today, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, these can be yours. These are the promises that await you if you will just admit that you're a sinner, which wasn't hard for me, and that you'll say, I believe. Even though I don't understand how it could happen, I don't understand all the details, I believe that Jesus was God, and He died in my place. All that we're speaking of today can be yours. So he's saying, bless God because He's already blessed us with all the blessings. And so Paul, as he does in so many places, just can't say enough about the blessedness, the praiseworthiness of God who has already done this. Now, that's the amazing thing. God doesn't live in finite time. He lives in eternity. So if you've come to know Christ as your Savior, Paul says, it's already all yours. 
You already are a citizen of heaven. We sang about it today. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. And there's a place that we're going to go, and it's going to be consummated for all eternity. But, but it's a done transaction. It's a completed transaction. It's already yours. You're already, if you know Christ as Savior, a citizen of heaven. Now, four of our children were born in Japan. So they were born and took their little pictures down to the embassy and applied for passports and birth certificates and, and all of those, those things. But when they were born, they were citizens of the United States. They weren't dual citizens. Jap Japan doesn't do that. They were citizens of the United States, but they'd never been there. See, they had two addresses. They had a temporary, temporary address in Japan, but they had a permanent address back at Grandma's house in Texas. They were citizens of a land to which they'd never traveled yet. However, when they were born, all the rights and privileges of being, the citizen of, the, of being a citizen of the United States were already theirs. And eventually they came and they, they saw the fulfillment of that. That's what this is talking about. He says this has already happened. God has already given you all the blessings, spiritual blessings of heaven. Amen. Now, you'll go there someday if you're a believer, but you already are there. Eternal life is not something that happens once we die. Eternal life is what you enter into when you come to know Christ. Well, he goes on in verse 4. He says, uh, let me elaborate. Let me tell you a little bit more. And so at the beginning of verse 4, he says, just as in this same way, there are some other things, he says, that are already yours. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. He chose you before the foundation of the world. Now, when was that? Yes. Certainly before creation. God's eternal past. There's no beginning for God. I don't understand that. I just know it's true. My little brain won't go there. I'd lock up and have to sit down. <laughs> but He's eternity past. And way back then, and way back then, and way back then, He already chose you. What, what things did God already know when He chose you? Well, He already knew that because of my sin, because of your sin, because of the sin of the world, He would send Himself in the form of the Son the Trinity, God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit, one person, three expressions. Again, I can't explain that to you in full. But he already knew he would send himself to die on the cross for us. And because he was God, he already knew that given the chance, you would say yes or you would say no. The Bible calls it the mystery of salvation. It is a mystery. I'm not a Calvinist. True Calvinism taken to its fullest uh, principles would say that God knew there were certain people He was creating that they would never have the chance. There would, it would be impossible for them to believe in Jesus, and that He created them only to let them live and die forever in hell. I cannot see that scripturally. I see that God says He loved the whole world. I see that He says it's not His will that any should perish. I, I see where the other side might see that, but here's the deal. As Southern Baptist, you can be a Calvinist. You can be a not Calvinist. Now, opposite of Calvinism is not Arminianism. It's a not Calvinist. It's got a catchy little title. Um, but uh, anyway, you can be the one. But we know this. The only way to heaven is to believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior, as the payment for your sin. That without His payment for sin, you would not have these spiritual blessings. You would not spend, an eter spend eternity with Him in heaven. But He says before time began, He chose you. You by name. He knew you. He knew that you'd come to know Christ as Savior. And he worked to get the gospel to you. We see this in the scripture. We see the Ethiopian eunuch willing to believe in God, believing that there was a God but not knowing about Christ. And so God sent the gospel to him. We see this over in Cornelius' house, a God-fearing man yet not knowing the truths of Christ. And so God sent the gospel to him. And if you haven't believed in Christ yet, you're just religious, you believe in God, guess what? God brought you here this morning to Sandia Baptist Church so that you would have the chance to hear that Jesus loves you and in a few moments that you might respond to that appeal, to that gift. He chose us before the beginning of the world that we would be holy and blameless before Him in love. Now, that holy there means to be set apart. He chose you that you would be set apart. Because you see, when we're citizens of a kingdom, there are also responsibilities. There are results of being citizens of that kingdom, of that nation. He chose you, and He did this. You can't do this. You can't make yourself holy. He is holy, and therefore, He cannot allow folks to come into heaven who haven't come to know Christ because, therefore, if He did, He wouldn't be holy. So, He demands perfect holiness, which we can't do. So, He sent Jesus so that when He looks at you, 
like he did with Abraham. Abraham believed God, we're told over in Genesis 15, 6, and it was counted to him, put into the ledger as righteousness because Abraham believed. So he wants to make you holy through what Christ did so that when he looks at you, he says, that one's holy, not because they have worked that out yet, and we never will until we reach heaven's gates, but because he's died and he has placed a stamp on our lives that says paid in full. He wants you to be holy before him, which he will do, and he will work out in you little by little, some days better than others, but to also be blameless. And the word here means to be a suitable sacrifice. All through the Old Testament, we see the lamb, the lamb, starting with Adam and Eve. The lamb was slain, a temporary sign of the one to come. The lamb never paid for anyone's sins itself. It was faith because God said to do this, so they did it. So the lamb, the lamb, the lamb was always just acting in faith, a temporary sign, a promise of the one who would come. And then when Jesus was baptized there, John the Baptist looks up and says, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. They all knew what he was referring to. And Jesus became the once and for all sacrifice for sin. Now, you want to keep blowing your mind. I'm going to set the smoke alarms off here. But Jesus' death on the cross paid for Abraham's sin. I don't understand that. I just know that it's true. So he chose you that he working through you would make you holy and blameless. Now, where to work these things out? It's only natural that if Jesus, if the Holy Spirit of God comes to live inside of me, things have to change on the inside, not just the outside. The outside's just religion. That doesn't go very far. That's frustrating. It'll work itself out outward too, but it has to start at the heart that I know Christ, and therefore He works these things out in me that He's already declared to be. He's declared me holy. He's declared me blameless, and then I begin to try to fall the right direction daily, walking after Him. He chose us, and Paul says, but that's not all. He also predestined us to adoption. Now, the predestination is a biblical term. There's no issue there. Sometimes people think predestination is Calvinism. No, the Scripture teaches us in more than one place that that God predestines us. The question comes, again, how does He predestine us? But He says before the beginning of time, He already said, this one is going to be mine. He knew all these things. I can't explain it, but He said, this one's going to be mine, and He marked your course And it was set in stone that you would become a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. He predestined us to adoption. Now, we know adoption is a good thing. Adoption is a wonderful thing. That's a great thing. It's a beautiful thing. It's a great way to share the gospel for a long, long time, for the rest of that child's life, as you use adoption as this, this exact biblical image of what Christ has done for us, what God's done through Christ. But it's, it's, it's great on the surface. It's splendid below the surface because Paul's speaking of Roman adoption here. And our adoption's wonderful. But Roman adoption was even to a de- deeper level. The Roman father ruled everything. He owned everything. He owned the people. He owned it all. And so when a Roman father chose to adopt someone else, it was an incredible thing he was doing. He was, by law, wiping everything they'd ever done clean. Every debt they ever had was wiped away. Now, natural parents could give their children up. They could turn them away if they wanted to. But by law, when a Roman father adopted you, you could never be turned away ever, no matter what what happened. You would have all the rights and authority of all the other children. The Scripture says about us in Christ that we become, if you believe in Jesus, you become joint heirs with Christ, that we become brothers and and not looked down upon stepbrothers of Jesus. We get what Jesus gets. Now, He's always going to be glorified. In fact, we're going to glorify Him in heaven. But we get a relationship with God that is that intimate, that personal, and we get everything that comes with knowing him as father. There are two Greek words at least for child here, but Paul uses the one that speaks of the son, the son who knows the father in this way. You have been predestined to be adopted as sons, as these these intimate children through Jesus Christ, to himself, according to the kind intention of his will. Your version may say, according to his good pleasure. <clears throat> it's an interesting word here, and it's kind of a mix, because it is the, the kind, the benevolent intention of his will that he looked upon us and said, I want to adopt them. I want them to be my intimate children. So it is the kind intention of his will, but the will, his kind intention of his will, pleases him. He looks at it and says, that's good. That's right. That's not what I would do if I were God. But that's what pleases him according to the kind intention of his will. Well, Paul's not through. 
He says then in these next few verses, he begins to talk about grace. To the praise of the glory of His grace, which He freely bestowed on us in the Beloved through Jesus. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, our sins, according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. Now, God had a choice. He looked down upon His creation. He saw that Adam and Eve sinned and that we would inherit a sin nature, and we would also sin as soon as we got the chance. And he could have just said, forget it. I just, I just obliterate that entire creation. I'll start over. I'll move on. But in the love, in the mercy, in the wisdom, in the marvelous plan of God, instead he looked down and he instantly, before the creation of the world, before time began, before the foundation of the world, he devised a beautiful plan and it involved his grace. What do we learn about His grace in these verses 6, 7, and 8? That it's glorious. That it is, it is good for us to sing and to verbalize and to praise and to thank Him for His grace. Nothing like it before, nothing like it ever again. And it says He freely, freely bestowed it on us. He didn't have to. He chose to. Now, I can't do as much for my children as I'd like to. But when I make a decision, you know, I, this, is, this is an area where I want to, to bless, you know, my children. I'm going to give them two hot dogs tonight, you know, or something. Uh, I'm kidding. But, 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 you know, you make that decision. You say, you know, I want, I want, if I'm going to do this, I want to do it well. That's what God said. He freely, he didn't have to. He wanted to. He freely bestowed. It's an old word there, of course. But the bestowing means that it's just overflowing. He's given you more than you need. It's like over in chapter 3, which we'll get to, where he just can't describe how great the power, the grace of God is. He gave to overflowing, he says, through the beloved, through Jesus. That is how he showed his grace. Again, I'm saying it over and over because some of you today, you need to come to know Christ as your Savior, or you've done so, and you need to just step out here in a few minutes and make it public and say, I'm ready. I'm going public with my faith in Jesus Christ. He said that it requires here a blood payment. We see this again. There's that lamb all through the Old Testament, the blood of the lamb, the temporary blood of the lamb, the temporary blood of the lamb, until Jesus shed the only sinless, perfect blood which was required ever. It required blood payment, and it forgave our sins, our trespasses forever. They're, they're washed white as, as, as snow. And God looks down and we say, oh, God, I'm still remembering all my sin. He says, I'm not. I paid for it. It's gone. Amazing. And then only he could do it because it says he was rich in grace. Only someone who had the riches of grace could provide this for us. And then in verse 8, it says again that he lavished it on us. Exceeding. To lavish is when your teenage son makes his bowl of ice cream where it's just overflowing. To lavish it on us. That's what he does with his grace. It's not only uh, able to meet the requirement, it's more than able. It's more than abundant to meet the requirements for our sin through his wisdom. Well, there's more that could be said there, but, but who are you? Where are you at in this situation? If you're a believer, then today just receive. Receive the rich promises and truths about your relationship with God, that it's already a transaction completed. And the complete fulfillment is waiting for you, but you already are able to be attached. You have special insight into heaven. One of our young fathers was baptized a few weeks ago here, and his father-in-law and mother-in-law were, were stuck. They couldn't get home because of some flight delays, and he was so anxious to make sure his in-laws were able to see that baptism, that there was all kinds of things working on behind the scenes, and we'll, we'll do it through FaceTime and all, because they weren't in the room, but they wanted to be able to see into what was happening in the room. We're physically not in heaven yet, but through what Christ has done on the cross as a believer, we already have access into the throne room of God. What an amazing treasure. Are you experiencing that? Are you today as a believer saying, you know, I've had a rough week and I, and I, I feel alone. We sang about it earlier. He's with you in the dark. He's with you at the dawn. He's with you every place. You're not as a believer in Christ, just some lost solitary soul out there all by yourself. 
No, you're already attached as an adopted child of God. You're attached to the throne room of heaven. There's nothing that comes your way that God doesn't want to hear about, no matter how small, no matter how big. You're not alone. You're in the Lord. But some of you don't know Christ as Savior. Today, come and trust Him. What about this God? The God who spoke the Sandias into existence. Incredible. The God who knows the stars by name. The God who flooded the earth. And as we've been exploring this great state and we go to those, those presentations and those videos and, and, the, and the people trying to explain Carlsbad Caverns and the white sands and, and all of these things. And, and you know, my, my kids are so happy that dad doesn't stand up and interrupt the video and go, I can explain it a lot easier for you. I can tell you how all that washed in here. What about this God that then before the foundation of the world chose you, predestined you, adopted you, and lavished his grace on you? If you know Christ, you're also then an agent, an ambassador. Because it's not right for us to sit in this room with all of these blessings and for the world to be dying around us. We're in the middle right now of a campaign called 30 Days of Sharing. We're halfway through. I in invite you, if you haven't gotten in, make it 14 days of sharing and be with us these next two weeks and just seek, just ask God to help you to talk to one person a day about Jesus or prayer or the church. And I I'm telling you, if you do, you'll have to be a little weird. You'll always be glad and it'll get you in the groove and you'll end up being more than one a lot of days because you're in the groove, you're thinking about, I'm not just going to the store, I'm not just going to the doctor, I'm not just here, I'm not just there. I'm an agent. I know some amazing things about the love of God and others must know. There are many ways that God's spoken to us today. Some of you need to come and just pray here. There's something that God said to you through this, this text that I didn't have any idea about and you just need to do some business with God. Some of you need to come. There'll be some pastors up front here and you need to say, I don't understand everything but I want to know Christ, and I want to be public about it. Some have done that, and you need to follow Christ in believer's baptism. Some of you, God's saying, for this time, this is your church home, and you need to make that public. So many ways God's spoken. Let's be doers of the things He's spoken to us. Let's pray. Father, thank You for Your Word. Oh, thank You for the riches, the promises, the, the overflowing, indescribable promises about how much You love us and what kind of God You are. Oh, Father, let no one leave this room today without knowing that they know that they know Christ is their Savior. God, help us to forget lunch. Help us to forget the afternoon's events. Help us to give you time to do business with you. Oh, Holy Spirit of God, fall on this place, I pray. Help each person to let you speak and then to move. Let those who need to come to know you and make it public just run to the front so anxious to declare that they know this God that loves us in this way. Oh, Father, move and work, I pray. In the name and the power and the blood of Jesus, we ask it. Amen.